<clears throat> all right just waiting for the signal saying we're live there we go all right welcome brothers and sisters to another online bible study pastor josh here with chapter christian church disciples of christ uh we're doing the story of david and one thing i really like about the old testament is the just vast amount of detail you get in these stories the problem is it can, it, it can get a little boring. It can get a little boring. So, chapter 19, we dove in really talking about uh, David's, or excuse me, Saul's jealousy and how it just continued to grow to where he finally tries to attempt to kill David and he runs. And David is now on the run. And uh, we go all through... Uh, chapter 20 is basically David and the son of Saul, Jonathan, making this pact saying, I'm going to, you know, Jonathan saying, I'm going to support you. I believe in you, David. You're like a brother to me, basically, is what they're, you know, David and Jonathan are thick as thieves. They are uh, like brothers in a way. I mean, the Bible really talks and stresses how much love they, and passion they have for one another. Uh, as brothers and wanting to protect each other. And so Jonathan's doing his best to protect David from Saul. And Saul keeps promising Jonathan he's not going to hurt David, I'm not going to hurt David, I'm not going to hurt David. And then all of a sudden, boom, here we go again. You know, he's trying to hurt David. <laughs> and so uh, Jonathan doesn't believe it at first. And basically, David has to prove it to him, and Jonathan starts to re realize Saul's deception and his just pure anger and wrath he has uh, for David. So, that's chapter 20, basically, in a nutshell, is David and Jonathan's relationship. And they take that chapter, they take that section... To really stress their union, that they are such close friends that it even goes beyond father and son relationship too. And and Jonathan is a clever enough guy, uh, excuse me, to recognize that Saul is is crazy. And so Jonathan and David make a covenant with each other, and Jonathan's going to do whatever he can to protect David. Saul finds out about this. He's very upset. And so now he's on, which actually infuriates Saul's anger even more towards David. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. It seems like it doesn't matter what David does. It just makes Saul mad. And this is where that anger and frustration we're talking about, where we allow it to consume us. Okay, um, it grows. This is the reason why forgiveness is such a big deal in the Bible. Okay, forgiveness is not letting that other person off the hook. The, the uh, forgiving people is about you learning to cleanse your heart and not carry that anger and resentment with you. That's what forgiveness is is about. That's part of it anyways. That's not That's not the whole thing. It's much more complicated and we can do a separate lesson for that. Um, but we see Saul, who was considered a good man at the beginning of the study. If you go all the way back several videos ago, we talked about how Saul was considered a good, righteous man. And because of his fame and because of his success, he sees this opportunity and his greed, his fear of losing support, excuse me, support. And now... You know, and so he defies God's orders. He loses God's favoritism. And now David's on the scene and he has gained the love of all the people. And the people still love Saul, but they seem to love David more. At least that's how David sees it. And so he... Huh, he's very upset. And this is... <laughs> in chapter 20, this covenant, when Saul finds out about this covenant, it makes him even angrier so now david is on the run he goes to uh to some priests in the city of nob 
and basically tells him, hey, I'm on the king's errand. Uh, if you could help us out. Uh, it was a rushed business, and I kind of forgot basic supplies. And so he gets uh, some food. <clears throat> Excuse me. He gets some food and then gets the Sword of Goliath, which happened to be there because that was the only weapon that they had. And so now David is carrying the Sword of Goliath and he's got some food. And somehow this gets back to Saul. And this is where we enter the story in 1 Samuel 22. Uh, David is continuing to run. Saul goes to Nob. He calls the priests out. Excuse me. Thanks. I don't know where these yawns come from, y'all. It's very annoying. I, I don't feel that tired. And so in verse 12, uh, so 1 Samuel 22, verse 12, Saul said, Listen now, son of Anitub, and says, Yes, my lord, he answers. Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me? You and your son, uh, you and the son of Jesse, giving him bread and a sword and inquiring God of God for him, so that he is rebelling against me and lies in wait for me as 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 he does today. The priest answered, "Who of all of your servants is as loyal as David, the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguards, and highly respected in your household?" Was that day the first time was that the first excuse me was that day the first time i inquired of god for him of course not let not the king accuse your servant of any uh of any of his father's family for your servant knows nothing about any of this whole affair the king said you will surely die you and your father's whole family and then he orders his guards to do it. The guards refuse to kill. They weren't uh, very uh, comfortable with this. And then uh, he turns to this servant who originally told Saul, this is where David is at Nob. He says, you kill him. And his name is, uh, I'm going to probably mispronounce this, Doge. And he kills the priest. And he ends up killing, I think it actually tells us the number. Uh, 85 men who were uh, 85 priests. He killed 85 priests. And not just the priests. Uh, uh, Saul puts the sword in the entire city of Nob and kills all the priests, women, children, <sighs> infants, and the cattle. All right. Donkeys and sheep. So Saul's insanity continues to grow. And this is a perfect example of allowing jealousy and not forgiving and allowing our own fears to stew inside that we create these elaborate uh, plots against us. David tells a false story to the priest. He tells him he's on the king's errand. And so, the, of course, he's... David, he's the right hand of the king. He is the, you know, all these titles that the priest lists. And so they're going to do what David says. Okay, that I mean, he has the authority. And so they do so, and they help him. And Saul shows up and says, why do you conspire against us? And he's like, man, I, I didn't know nothing about this. What are you talking about? This is David we're talking about, the most beloved servant, your son-in-law, he he's the guy, right? He's the he's the like best person in the kingdom beside you, O king. Why would I question him? And Saul doesn't believe him. He allows his paranoia to go so deep. He does not believe this priest's story. And so not only does he kill this priest, he kills his entire family. He kills all the priests in the town. He destroys this entire town. There's not but one survivor, we are told. And there you go. And it, 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 it blows my mind how quickly this escalates in this story. But it, it really is kind of interesting. Um... Uh, 
how we allow jealousy to continue to grow and get stronger. And it's the same point we make in the last video, but we see it just go on to a whole nother level. It is absolutely insane how crazy this is. It was clear that these priests did not know that David was out of favor. And Saul has construed in his mind that everybody's against him. Anyone who shows favoritism or is even nice to David must be my enemy. And boy, does that speak true. I mean, how many times do we hear this? Like, if you like Trump, then the people who don't like Trump must hate you, or, or vice versa. Or if you like Biden, same thing. I mean, you know, it's absolutely insane that if we disagree, we must now hate each other. If you show, if you are kind to a person I don't like, then I must hate you because you are my enemy now. How dare you be nice to them? And, and I, I don't ever understand this logic. Uh, I've had people tell me before, if this certain person comes up to the shop, don't service them. They're blah, 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 and says all kinds of names I really don't feel comfortable repeating on this app. <laughs> and, and so we see all this anger and frustration uh, boiling over, and basically, you know, how can you let someone like that in your shop? How can you do business with them? Blah, 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 blah. And I was like, you know, it, it's... I don't know what they've done to you, but I am told by God, by Jesus, to show everyone the grace of God. And, you know, if they try to hurt me, okay, then, you know, we'll handle it then. But, you know, just because you tell me to, and we're friends, or, or you know me, doesn't mean that I have to listen to you. And, and here it is, Saul just saying, you know, they're nice to David, they help David, I must hate them, and I must destroy them, how dare they betray me. And they're trying to explain to him, like, look, are you serious? This is David. This is David. How was I supposed to know? And on top of this, notice how Saul keeps saying he's rebelling against me. And not once has David taken any military action against Saul or any of Israel. All David has done is run from place to place. You can go back and read chapters 20, 21, and all of 22, and what you will find, uh, since we covered 19, when Saul first really came after David's life, what you will find is all David has done is lay low, try to stay away from Saul, and try to clear his name, and try to figure out what's going on. Why is Saul hating me so much? I've done nothing but what he's asked me to do. I've been a loyal servant. I have been this person for Saul. Why is he trying to kill me? And Saul allows David's fame and his jealousy for it to gear around and churn in his head. And all these thoughts, thoughts are not dangerous unless you let them get down deep into your soul. That's when thoughts get dangerous. When you start feeling them down here. And that's what was going on with Saul. And he allowed them to get down in here. And they've allowed him to get into this point where he's so angry that he is willing to kill an entire town. A town known as the city of priests. There's just a bunch of priests in this town. They kill 85 of them and destroy the entire city. And I'm not talking about they just destroyed the buildings. They killed every living thing in that town. Women, children, infants, the cattle, the sheep, all of them. Donkeys. It, it lists, it, you know, kills women, its children, and infants, and its cattle, donkeys, and sheep. All of them. Anything that breathed died in that town. That is how crazy Saul has become. That is how much this anger and resentment has went down that he believes this entire city conspired against him and now he's going to destroy it to prove to anyone how dare you defy me. Now remember that Saul won the people's hearts 
by leading them in battle against their real enemies, but then showing great honor and respect to, the, to those who fought for him by protecting the people, being a good and honorable person. And now he's trying to rule through fear, which is not what got him beloved. And so now God is painting this picture with the people that Saul is an evil, evil dude. And Saul is becoming this great evil. He wasn't evil. He allowed this evil to corrupt him and get deeper into him and, and, and churn and get worse and worse. And I'm telling y'all, if you're in that spiral of thinking where you can't seem to escape, and it's not just thoughts, it's, it's getting deeper, okay? It starts up here, and, and thoughts aren't particularly dangerous, as I just said. They get dangerous as they get deeper, okay? And when, when they get deeper... That's when we start to really struggle. And it's clear this is what happened to Saul. He has taken to heart that David has genuinely wronged him. That he's a genuine threat to David, yet, or to Saul. David is a true threat. And yet, David has done nothing to Saul. He, has done, he hasn't raised his hand. He hasn't even said a bad word about Saul. I'm sure he has. Maybe the story didn't tell us that part. But as far as we know, David has done everything he's supposed to do to be an honorable, loyal servant. And he has done everything Saul has asked him to do. So, you're talking about a man who's doing everything right. And because of this, he gets a lot of fame. You get jealous of that fame. That jealous gets in deeper. And you convince yourself that David is against him. And that's what Saul happened. He convinced himself David is against him. Now, I see people do this all the time. They, they, they make up their mind and thinking that something is really there. And I'm like, you know, hold, hold up. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why do you think this? I just, I just know. I just know. I said, no, what you've done is you've dwelled on this and convinced yourself that this is what's going on. But you have no evidence for it. We need to step back. And I'm not saying you're 100% wrong. What I'm saying is you could be completely wrong. I said you could be right, you could be wrong, you just don't know. Oh, I know, I know. I hear people do it all the time. And over time, what happens? A lot of times they're wrong. Because they've allowed these thoughts to spiral and spiral and spiral. And once you get them down here, you start allowing them to get deeper into your soul, to your heart. You know what happens Reason doesn't exist anymore. I know people who hate Trump so much. Just by mentioning his name, they flare up. They get angry. I know people who hate Biden the same way. Now, Trump could come up with, when he was president, he could have came up with the greatest plan in the history of plans. Not just him bragging about it. I'm like a genuine greatest plan. But they hate this man so much that just because he says it, they're not going to support it. I know people, same thing with Biden. And instead of using reason and logic to work through and say, okay, is this a good plan? Is what they're saying true? Is it plausible? Instead of going through that route, they have allowed this anger to get down in here into their soul, into their heart, and it doesn't need reason. You just need emotion to get it going. And that's the problem. That, that, that's where the issue lies. Saul has convinced himself that David is against him. No evidence for it. None. The only thing that happened was that the people praised David more than Saul. That laid the seed. You go back in chapter 19, that's where this started. I believe it was 19 where they say Saul killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. Um, I'm flipping back here in the Bible. Oh, excuse me. It's chapter 18. Chapter 19 is when Saul tries to kill him. So chapter 18 is where Saul, you know, they're praising David more than Saul. Saul, that seed of jealousy gets planted. That evil spirit comes on him, and it just gets deeper and deeper into his soul till he's finally convinced David's doing something. He tries to kill him. He flees, comes back, 
tries to kill him again. He flees again. And now he's on the run. And Jonathan takes a covenant with David because he knows David's in the right. And Saul sees this as a bigger betrayal and he's trying to turn his own children against him. Uh, <coughs> his daughter uh, lies for David when he escapes. And Saul gets upset over that. And, and so all of this builds up and it's building up a case that David is against Saul even though there's no evidence for it. But because people keep siding with David, he just keeps thinking David's against him. And that everybody's against him and he must destroy David to end this threat. And so then we get into verse or chapter 21 and we see Saul's paranoia get the very best of him. And he does something absolutely egregious in chapter or in, in chapter 22 where he kills an entire town just because they gave David and his men some bread and a sword. Absolutely crazy. And you can see how this stuff, he's convinced that David is rebelling against him. David hasn't taken any military action against him. He hasn't done anything other than I'm escaping because I don't want you to kill me. This is how our spot, when we allow anger to enter our hearts, this is how easily the evils of this world can manipulate us to do some very crazy and egregious things. And we need to remember that. I know that's kind of the lesson we had last week, but we're going to stress it even harder because I, I feel like we live in a world today we have allowed anger and resentment to enter our hearts so much and we, we get so upset with each other and how dare you be a Democrat, they support this. How dare you be a Republican, they support this. How dare you do this? How dare you do that? Oh, you said something 20 years ago, blah, 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 blah. We, we can't let things go. We can't truly forgive. And so all this anger and resentment gets built up and it starts becoming part of us. Originally, this was just an evil spirit and David played a flute and it went away. Now, it's an evil spirit that has, uh, and as far as we know, the evil spirit's not with Saul at this moment. He's just allowed all that anger and resentment to get so deep, he's convinced it's real. And this is what happens when we allow anger to get deeper into our hearts. We blame everybody for our own problems. We are convinced the world's against us. And nothing anybody says or does will change our mind. I can think of a lot of people. This is true. Let us pray. Heavenly Gracious Father, we thank you for allowing us to gather here today to learn a little more about your word. And we ask, Lord, you help us take this lesson and, and make it part of our lives and make it stronger for ourselves and help us forgive. Help us Remove this anger and darkness out of our hearts, and especially out of our souls, <coughs> so that we can keep ourselves cleansed and allow your son to live there instead. I ask, Lord, if anyone's listening to this video and they're struggling with, the, with this battle, for them to reach out. Help them have the courage to reach out to their pastor, to us, to, who, to whoever they feel may help them. And help them get through these dark times, Lord. Because we all have been through there where dark thoughts seem to surround us. And we have all have fought battles like that before. It's not easy. But we ask, Lord, through your guidance. And we know, Lord, through your guidance. That we can conquer them with your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless.